Thank you, Howard, and good morning, everyone. So uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce as our first speaker my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Amit Sachdev. Um, he is the Director of Neuromuscular Medicine here at Michigan State University and is also an Assistant Professor of uh, Neurology uh, within the Department of Neurology and Ophthalmology. Um, he is a devoted father and husband, but is also very passionate about tying his clinical efforts with research advocacy and awareness around myasthenia gravis. Um, as Howard mentioned, he serves on our medical advisory board and also has a position with our board of directors. Um, and incidentally, I've had the privilege over the last few weeks of assisting Dr. Satchdave with an elective course for our first and second year medical students here at MSU. It's an um, elective in clinically related neuroscience. And just this past week, uh, Dr. Satchdave introduced a patient with myasthenia gravis to our first and second year medical students. And I can tell you, they were nothing short of awed to be able to meet a patient to learn about this disease and learn about its expert management from someone as accomplished as Dr. Satchi. So we're very grateful to have him with, here, with us here this morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Satchi. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bliss. And when you hear an introduction like that, uh, you envision someone who's uh, seven feet tall uh, and probably more ruggedly handsome. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and I cer certainly don't feel that way. In fact, I am humbled um, to, to be here today to help to assist this community um, to move forward uh, and to try to treat a condition that we know doesn't have to kill people, it doesn't kill people today, but that word gravis is a scary word um, because it means it did. Um, and so that, that victory uh, is important. Uh, and so our next step is to stop talking about a disease that kills people um, and stop accepting a disease that costs quality of life. Uh, and, uh, and that's really the importance of research. Uh, and that's I, what I hope to talk to you about today is the clinical trials um, that are active, uh, in particular the ones that focus on uh, beating the basic mechanisms of the disease. Um, so treating the autoimmune attack in, in our patients who have autoimmune myasthenia. Uh, and so with that, let's go ahead and talk about myasthenia. Uh, and incidentally, um, those medical students got the diagnosis. Uh, it took a little bit of leading but they ended up diagnosing the patient with myasthenia. Uh, and those were first and second years. Um, and possibly some of them will never see another case or never recognize it, but somebody somewhere might become a neurologist because they met that patient. Um, and so really the hero there is that patient who was willing, who unfortunately is a really tough case and was willing to come in with double vision and an eye patch and slurred speech um, and tell his story. Um, and so, who am I again? My name is Amit Sachdev, and my role is I direct neuromuscular medicine here. Um, I care for approximately 140 patients with myasthenia gravis. Uh, and it's because of you guys that we are able to offer clinical trials, um, that we are attractive as a clinical trial site. Um, but not everybody is the right patient for a clinical trial, and it's our hope that uh, I can convey to you what is available, why we think these treatments might work, what are the, what's the right patient who might want to consider enrolling. Um, so why did I title it this way, immune modulating. So you can have a clinical trial that tries to work on the body's defense system and turn down the overactivity, or you can have a clinical trial that attempts to cover up the symptoms, make the network more efficient. And we're really going to focus on the, the clinical trials that try to get to the heart of the disease, the, the immune modulation or the overactive immune system. For those of you who are on treatment for myasthenia gravis, we have one approved and many unapproved treatments. Um, treatments like, um, uh, like cyclosporin or uh, rituximab uh, or uh, uh, azathioprine methotrexate, uh, IVIG. So these treatments are all immune modulators. And so the next question is, uh, what is the next step in immune modulation? 
And that's why we're focusing on those today. Uh, and then why am I specifying autoimmune myasthenia gravis? Because there is a population who um, have myasthenia because their network wasn't quite built right. Uh, and those patients, unfortunately, do not qualify for these kinds of clinical trials. Um, there may be other opportunities for that. So before we go any further, we do need to talk about conflicts of interest. When I run a clinical trial, I see some financial compensation for that. Now the way Michigan State University manages that is that I don't actually get to take a paycheck from the revenues generated from the clinical trials. I do get to use that money to pay for going to conferences. Uh, I do get to use that money to pay for support staff, um, to build the program, but I don't get to use any of that clinical trial money to pay myself. And so, but there is money that I can use to advance my career and go to sunny destinations for uh, meetings. And that's a benefit, and that means there's a conflict. And so you need to know that, that I get paid or compensated in some way for the things that we're going to be talking about. And what you're seeing here is a list of various conflicts um, and places where I am a speaker doing educational programs, places where I'm a principal investigator for clinical trials, places where I am uh, a uh, consultant, trying to help companies figure out how they should direct their efforts. Um, and so a lot of this is financial compensation. Some of it is not financially compensated, a member of board organizations, or a board member of organizations, but I get prestige and career advancement. And so these are conflicts. Okay, so types of myasthenia gravis. So again, you have myasthenic syndromes and they fall under either autoimmune or congenital. Congenital are patients who the network that helps them move was never quite built right. And the defect is not that the muscles weren't built right or that the nerves weren't built right, but the relay system in between. And so for those patients, it doesn't make sense to put them on steroids or to try to reduce inflammation in their body because that's not their problem. These patients are pretty rare, but they are our little petri dishes, right? There is a predictable problem with their network, and if you can try to move the needle on their problem, you might learn something about how you help patients in general. And so these patients are rare, there are human experiments, something has gone wrong in their development, and we learn so much from them um, and trying to help their disease. Uh, but they are not going to be the focus of today's talk. They are a very important population, and whenever we see a patient with congenital myasthenia, my personal knowledge base of the disease increases because their, di their disease has affected them in a certain way. We're going to focus instead on autoimmune conditions the autoimmune population is patients who have inflammation in their body. And there are four types of recognized autoimmune conditions within myasthenia. Uh, there's a fifth if you include Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. But uh, I'm focusing predominantly on the muscle side here. Um, so acetylcholine, musk, LRP4, and seronegative. The reason that I'm bringing out these four is because this first one right here, acetylcholine, is the most common. And so if you have a problem where your body is creating inflammation, 85% of the time, the inflammation is because your body is attacking this thing, the acetylcholine receptor. And the vast majority of our trials focus here on the acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so then again, when we think about um, patients of acetylcholine myasthenia, you can talk about medications that manage symptoms. Many patients in this room will be on pyridostigmine. Um, and some patients in this room who have Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome might be on a drug Ferdax. Um, the, so also known as 3,4-DAP. So symptom management does not try to reduce inflammation. Immune modulation does try to reduce inflammation. Okay. So, 
when we think about immune modulation, how do we reduce inflammation? The current strategies focus on T cell therapies, B cell therapies, or complement inhibitors. Now, I'm going to explain that in a little bit. But these are the basic focuses of ways we try to reduce inflammation. Most of these treatments are not FDA approved. So what does that mean? Well, not FDA approved for myasthenia. In order to get a drug in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration has to approve a drug for sale. They have to decide that on the basis of clinical trials, that that drug is safe and effective. But those clinical trials often focus on one particular disease. At that point, the drug is available for physicians to use, and physicians might elect to use it for other purposes. If you think about antibiotics, for example, if you want to bring a new antibiotic to market, you might focus on kidney infections or pneumonias. But you might recognize that the same bug that causes pneumonias also commonly causes skin infections. And a really nasty skin infection, if it's the same bug, you might say, let's try this new drug. That's up to the physician. The physician is allowed to do that if they have some logic. But it's not an FDA-approved use of the new drug. The FDA-approved use is the pneumonia, not the skin infection. And so many of the drugs that we use in myasthenia have been approved for other purposes, thought to be safe for the human body, toxic in predictable and low-risk ways, but not necessarily proven to be the best choices or effective in myasthenia to the high standard that is FDA approval. The only class of drugs here is the complement inhibitors that have true FDA approval for use in myasthenia. And so that's interesting, because when we talk about new clinical trials that are available, many of them focus on complement inhibitors. And we'll talk about what does that mean. So when we're thinking about clinical trials, there are four phases of a clinical trial. The first phase is the most basic. You give this, you've given this drug to animals, and you've seen how it affects animal systems, you now want to give it to healthy humans to make sure that you can understand how is it broken down and by the body, to make sure that it actually gets close to the target tissues, that it stays in the bloodstream, doesn't go into the fat, and just stay there. You want to make sure that it is not obviously toxic. So people, healthy people don't get ridiculously sick. There are many drugs that enter phase one that never get past phase one. In general, if you're a patient of mine, I don't counsel you to enter phase one uh, because phase one is very premature. Phase two. Phase two is a more interesting phase of drug development. At this point, you've decided that you understand how the human body processes the drug, but you're not quite sure in a diseased patient what is the right dose? So some people will get no drug, sugar water. Some people will get a very low dose. Some people a high dose. Some people a moderate dose. And oftentimes in myasthenia clinical trials, if the drug is thought to be effective in phase two, the patient will continue to receive the drug until drug development ends. So the drug is either approved or proven not to be effective. So you get an extension where you're guaranteed early access to the drug. So phase two, you try to figure out what's the right dose. Phase three, you have decided what the right dose is, and now you're doing a large scale trial to try to determine, is this truly going to work? And is the benefit sufficient enough? And in today's environment, the Food and Drug Administration asks that that's not just a physician call. The Food and Drug Administration wants patient-centered measures. The patients have to say, my quality of life has improved in some way. Not just physicians saying, well, the disease seems to look better on paper. And you have to meet though that standard to pass through phase three 
and then you get FDA approval, and then you have to keep on watching the drug. That's phase four. So when we talk about clinical trials, here at least at MSU, our approach is to focus on phase two and phase three. Some of the other centers that are involved in clinical trial work in the state of Michigan in myasthenia, Henry Ford, Wayne State, also focus predominantly on phase two and phase three trials. Okay. So, you, how do you choose the right candidate? This is the hardest part, especially in a disease where, in my, like myasthenia, where we have a whole host of medications that we think might work. They're not particularly FDA approved for myasthenia, but they seem to help. They're written into the guidelines of how we manage myasthenia. And so, and the risk of not managing myasthenia well is people end up in the hospital, they end up on breathing machines, they can't chew, can't swallow, lose weight, can't participate at work. So the risk of getting myasthenia wrong is substantial issues with health and quality of life. And so, if you have a patient who's doing pretty good on the current therapies that they have, and that patient um, is not, um, not getting some adverse side effects, it's hard to justify moving them into a clinical trial because the risks of getting it wrong, or perhaps the risks of going on placebo, which is sugar water, can be high. And so this is the hardest part Again, I, I see 140 patients with myasthenia gravis annually. And if I'm counseling my patients appropriately, I might enroll a handful into clinical trials, two, three percent of that number, four to five a year. That is our goal, that's all we promise, is one to two per, per trial. Because the risk of getting this wrong is high, and the therapies that we have today are pretty good. Okay, so let's talk about autoimmune myasthenia. So, the, and in particular, we're focusing on patients with acetylcholine receptor myasthenia and new lines of clinical trial work. Okay, so what you're looking at is active clinical trials, and what I'm going to explain to you is what each of these lines are. So the complement inhibitors, what is that? Okay. So when you have a muscle, okay. can everybody see that okay? Yeah, okay. So this is muscle, okay? And over here, you have nerve. Okay. So on the surface of the muscle, you have these receptors. Okay. And these receptors receive acetylcholine. We abbreviate them. Oh, I'm not going to use abbreviations. Okay. Now, in myasthenia, a signal will come down the nerve, and that signal will for force the nerve to release these little packets of transmitter. So the signal is coming down and there's this little packet at the end and the packet will merge with the wall and dump out transmitter. Now those little transmitter dots are too small. Let me see here. Okay, that's transmitter. Okay, and it all came from in there. Now the transmitter, let's see if I could use a thicker brush. Ooh, that's too thick. That's, 
the transmitter will flow down over here and will attach to the receptor and it'll make something go. It'll make the muscle twitch, okay? So that's the relay station, okay? Now why did I just draw that out for you? Well, in myasthenia gravis, in the acetylcholine receptor mediated myasthenia gravis, the body will produce antibodies, these little flags, okay? And in fact, I'm gonna switch colors here to, we can do better than that, okay. Okay, so, and we can do better than that. Too bad, too much better. All right, that's fine. <laughs> That's fine. We're gonna we're gonna denote a antibody with these red blotches. Okay. So these red blotches equals antibody. These are the flags that your body uses to mark something for destruction. So if you get the chicken pox, then you never get the chicken pox again. If you get the measles vaccine. You really shouldn't get the measles again. How do we confirm that you got the measles vaccine? We draw your blood and we look for the antibody marker. Once your body learns how to defend yourself against something, it creates antibodies. And those antibody markers should persist for the rest of your life. Which is why when you get myasthenia and it's autoimmune, your body's defense system is overacting. We should be, you harbor that ability to damage yourself for the rest of your life. You might go into remission, you might not need medicines for a while, but you could also have the symptoms come back. And so since the antibodies are in the, uh, in the bloodstream, the antibodies attach to things that they shouldn't, in particular these receptors, okay? They attach to these receptors, and they make these receptors not work as well, but they also create inflammation. So that's what this blue is, okay? Is inflammation, and the inflammation damages the muscle. So blue equals inflammation. So what is the inflammation? The inflammation is a chemical reaction, and that chemical reaction is called the complement cascade. A complement <coughs> inhibitor that does nothing to the antibodies, they're still there, does nothing to the antibodies attaching to the receptors, they're still there. But if you remove the inflammation, the thought is there's less destruction. You're less likely to develop symptoms. <coughs> so this actually works, it appears to. Um, there is one drug on the market right now, reclusumab, that does just this, and is FDA approved for the use in myasthenia gravis. And so this is, because there's a drug on the market, there is interest in more of more drugs that do the same thing. And so that, let me go to presentation mode, is what's going on here. There are two clinical trials right now. One is from RA Pharmaceuticals. It is a phase three subcutaneously administered. So you poke yourself in the belly and give yourself a shot every day. If you've ever been on Lovenox, You've done the same thing. If you've been on insulin, you've done the same thing. In fact, the actual injector, the, the device that you poke yourself with is the same thing that is used for Lovenox. Um, and so this class of drugs, the complement inhibitors, is an FDA approved. And there's one drug in this class that is FDA approved, is available for use in patients with myasthenia. There are two more types of this class of drug on the way. One is a version where you poke yourself in the belly, and another is a version where you get an IV infusion, but the infusion lasts eight weeks. 
The current way that you get a complement inhibitor is that you get an IV infusion, but you have to get one every two weeks. So these are the alternative options. Neither of these alternatives have been proven to be effective in myasthenia. And so that's the role for the clinical trial. The complement inhibitors, at least to the current version that is FDA approved, is effective in about 60% of patients. And the side effect profile of the current version is pretty decent. Uh, and so this is a really promising avenue in my mind. We know that this complement inhibitors appear to work in about 60% of patients. The current way that these drugs are delivered is with an infusion every two weeks. The clinical trials include an eight-week version or a subcutaneously administered version. The STAR indicates clinical trials available here at Michigan State. Um, and so these two are available, <coughs> available here. They're going through the contracting phase right now, so they're not available right now. Um, but we have been site-selected and should be available um, in the next uh, probably six weeks. Uh, and so this is a very interesting and promising avenue for clinical trial development. The next thing I'm going to focus on, since I'm a little short on time, is the FCRN inhibitors. Now, we talked about complement inhibitors are available on the market, at least one of them is, and what's being studied is additional companies bringing to market different formulations. The FCRN inhibitors are not available on market in any disease that I'm aware of. And so this is an entirely novel class of medication. The, this class of drug is being studied by three different companies. One version is IV, two versions are subcutaneous. That is, again, inject yourself into the belly. The IV version should be available at the clinical trial here. Again, we've been site-selected. This trial is active at other sites, and we're going through the motions of becoming active here. The subcutaneous ones are not available here. The UCB one should be going to the next phase of development. The RTV one is not uh, open yet. So what is an FCRN inhibitor? Okay, so this diagram was all about what happens when nerve meets muscle. And what you noticed in the conversation about complement inhibitors is that we didn't touch the antibodies. There are other therapies for myasthenia gravis that do touch the antibodies. These are off-label. That means the FDA hasn't approved them in particular for myasthenia. They are IVIG and rituxan. Uh, also cytoxan. So those three drugs touch the antibody loads, attempt to change the antibody profiles. So what do the FCRN inhibitors do? So this time, what you're going to see is here is a blood vessel, okay? This is a blood vessel, and blood is flowing this way. And we decided that red was an antibody, okay? So red is the antibodies. Now on the side of the blood vessel, the blood vessel is made up of, oh, I am not black. Well, maybe I'm gonna do, still red, there we go. The side of the blood vessel is made up of cells little compartments that actually make up the blood vessel. And it turns out that these cells have a role in cleaning the blood. And so what happens is the blood vessel will take a gulp of blood, and in that gulp it will capture the contents of the bloodstream. Just sort of randomly, each blood vessel has is made up of these compartments, and these little cells will take gulps and will clean what's in the blood. Now, there's a mechanism by which 
you rescue antibodies. Because you wouldn't want your blood vessel lining damaging or depleting all of your antibodies. Otherwise, you would never develop an immunity. So as a part of natural cleaning of the blood, the blood vessels actually take gulps and uh, break down stuff that's in the blood. Things that need to be saved are spit back out. The FCN inhibitors very aggressively damage the spit back out phenomenon. So your blood vessels will chew up whatever is in the bloodstream that is not saved, and the antibodies get chewed up. As you can imagine, this is not a specific process to a specific kind of antibody. If you give a patient an FCRN inhibitor, all of their antibody loads drop. So, no antibodies, presumably no disease. But unfortunately, you would wonder, well, what happens to your immunity? That's being studied. Now, in general, Dropping antibody loads is thought to be effective in myasthenia gravis. We use different treatments that do exactly that. And those patients have manageable risks of infections. And so this, while this doesn't sound like a great idea on paper, it's not actually all that different to stuff we already do. And it might actually be more targeted than what we're currently doing. This class of drugs, these FCRN inhibitors, are interesting because they should be very effective at dropping antibody loads. And so you would wonder, could they be effective across the spectrum of autoantibody myasthenic syndromes, rather than just one or the other subtype? Maybe. It's a really interesting area of study. But since, as again, to my knowledge, there is not one of these drugs on market today, these are phase two trials. This trial, the UCB Pharma trial that's in front, that has closed, appears to have had an adequate safety profile, and they are going to phase three. Um, the drugs behind it, the Momenta drug and the RFVT drug, have not yet completed their trials. We don't know about their safety profiles. But at least in the UCB trial, the basic mechanism in that trial seemed to not harm patients enough to stop development. There are risks to everything you do. So this FCRN inhibitor pathway is interesting. The question is, how much data can we get about harm? And it might be a very useful mechanism to treat myasthenia, because it would get to the heart of the problem in autoimmune cases that there are antibodies that don't belong, targeting things that we need. Uh, the last line of development um, has not panned out thus far, as far as I can understand. The rituximab trial actually was negative. This CFZ trial closed in 2017. This focuses on the actual production of antibodies. Purportedly, the CFZ trial was actually a positive trial, that it actually might have helped patients. But to go from 2017 to 2019 with no additional development work makes you wonder if there was an issue with that agent. Um, and so there is additional development work. There are single site trials where different drugs are being tried. These, I've tried to focus on multi-site, big national trials, uh, and we're doing three of them here. Again, you may not be the right patient. You might be happy with the therapies you're on. Finding the right patient is the challenge. And uh, it's a challenge because it's my duty and obligation to make sure that you're, we're doing things as safe as possible. Okay. So with that, um, we started a little late, we ended a little late. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and yield the stage. If you're interested in trials, oh, you know what? Let me give you a different email address. It was late last night that I... There we go. That I put together these slides.
So that's the email address I would suggest. If you're interested in trial, shoot me an email. Um, and uh, always it's going to be an initial consultation to talk about whether or not we need to move down an experimental therapy route. Um, I'm a very conservative guy when it comes to that conversation. Uh, and, um, and so most of the time, the answer is going to be no. But maybe we can do something with conventional therapies that changes your disease. Okay. And with that, I will go ahead and yield the floor.